Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We welcome you again to another discussion of the Doctrine and Covenants. Today joining me, Guy Dorius, will be Jerry Perkins, Steve Harper, Craig Osler, and we're all members of the faculty of the Church History and Doctrine Department at Brigham Young University. Our topic for discussion today will be sections 90 through 93. And uh, Brother Harper, why don't you lead off and uh, teach us a little bit about the uh, historical context here and, and uh, where we're going to go with these sections. Okay, thanks Guy. These uh, sections were all received by Joseph Smith in the first two weeks of March of 1833, that is 90, 91, 92, the first few we'll talk about. Section 90 um, declares that Joseph and his counselors in the First Presidency, Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams, are all in possession of the keys of the kingdom and that they receive the oracles or in other words the revelations. The revelations come from from the first presidency to the church verse 4 says and then uh, verse 9 that through your administration the church may receive the word and the counselors can receive the word and through their administration the, ad the administration of the counselors the word may go forth unto the ends of the earth unto the Gentiles first and then unto the Jews. You know, just, to, just to interject, I think it's very interesting when they mention the keys being given in verse 3, is that uh, in speaking to Joseph, he tells him the keys of the kingdom will never be taken from him in this world or in the world to come. And that represents a real milestone <laughs> in uh, the prophet's development. Uh, if you go back to section 3, the first revelation the prophet wrote down, mm -hmm. it was by no means sure at that point that he was going to successfully carry out his prophetic ministry. And what I'm looking at uh, here, he's in the matured. I mean, he's going to have them when he dies. Yeah. This isn't something he, I mean, I, I've been released from holding keys <laughs> several times on earth. And here's Joseph told, even if you die, yeah. you still are directing the work of the kingdom in the world of spirits. He's standing at the head of this dispensation. Yeah, It's very impressive. And uh, I don't think we want to spend an awful lot of time on it. Uh, viewers may want to take these things and, and then do some more exploration, but there's a, some economic um, directions the Lord has as far as guiding and leading the church. A woman named Vienna Jakes, a, a Boston area convert, has come seeking to know what she can do, and she consecrates an enormous reserve of money she has You're to the to helping of the kingdom. Yeah, <coughs> thank you, Craig. And so there's some terrific things in there about that, which help also coincide with section 92. Section 91 comes as Joseph inquires of the Lord what to do about the Apocrypha in his translation or revision of the Old Testament. Uh, viewers may know that the Apocrypha is a collection of books over which Catholics and Protestants have argued uh, whether it deserves a place among the sacred literature uh, of the Bible. Joseph didn't know the answer to that question. And so he seeks the answer and the Lord says, you don't need to translate the Apocrypha. There's a lot of stuff in there that's of questionable value. There's a lot of stuff in there that's really uh, significant and readers can discern the difference by the Holy Spirit. Why do you think that that's that be the case? What's the difference between the Apocrypha? I've always thought, what's the difference between the Apocrypha and anything else that's written? Maybe it is that the things that we have are the, the crucial things, the really important things. Most of Joseph's revelations and so much of the other scriptures we have are things that we desperately need in order mm -hmm. to know our way back to our Heavenly yeah. Father. Joseph could have gone through the Apocrypha, mm -hmm. translated it, and used prophetic type of editing, but he chose, yeah. the Lord chose not to. It's interesting. Know, I, I know I like to read the Apocrypha, but it's for a different reason than I like to read the Book of Mormon. Yeah. It's, I read well, it for it's information, for amusement, yeah. right. Right. Uh, but it may be that the scripture that we have is on a higher level of, of importance. 
Section 92, very brief, to Frederick G. Williams, commanding that he, now as a, a brand new member of the First Presidency, be admitted to the United Order, which is a, a group of church leaders who, whose job it is to administer the temporal affairs of the church, hold the church's property, and so forth, uh, operating on the principles of the law of conssecration given in section 42 and elaborated on in mm -hmm. other sections and I know you know when he joins this United order he also consecrates mm -hmm. about I think it's about 144 acres there in the Kirtland area he has yeah. significant property mm -hmm. and prestige to consecrate to the church and, and serves it well and then we jump to 93. And 93, we want to spend the majority of the time on because it, it has some really crucial doctrines uh, that tie the past in the Doctrine and Covenants to the future and, and the things that are going on. I, uh, it, section 93, uh, Craig, uh, mm -hmm. I know as you and I have spoken before, verse 19 seems to tell us what the first 18 verses of 93 are about. Do you, do you want to jump in there and, sure. and cover that I love, for us? Yeah, this, yeah, this to is, me is one of the most incredible revelations given to the prophet Joseph Smith. And after, you know, right in the middle he says, I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship. And I, I look at this, it's, it, the revelation is we're going to know the true character of God the Father and Jesus Christ and the manner in which we're to worship the Father because of what is in this section. And, and then verse 19, to what end? That we can in due time receive of his fullness. Yeah. And so, so we're introduced in the first verse kind of to the, just a, it's a cookbook summary of how we worship. <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay, obey uh, who forsaketh his sins, uh, cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. So, just, so just, in a, yeah, just in a nutshell, it's, it's pray, keep the commandments, obey. <laughs> but, but then all of a sudden the, the meat of this yeah. comes in now, here is who I am. This is almost the resume. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you'll agree, this sets us apart fundamentally from a lot of faiths in our view of the Savior's development yeah. as, a, as a, a mortal uh, and how, he, how he's come and given us the perfect example in these verses. Which I think is what he's doing is saying, I am going to teach you how I worship That's the right. Father. Mm -hmm. And I always think of As that as an of, example of how, what you should do. We, we <laughs> worship by becoming like our Savior, who became like his father. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're, no, it was great, because that's what I think of. It's like a child that worships a ball player. Yeah. <laughs> they want to be just <clears throat> like them, wear their number on their shirt and everything that's else. Right. And what I find so incredible uh, is just that the Savior already had become one with the Father before he was born in mortality. And he gives it all up That's to right. condescend into mortality. And it's like he starts all over again, empty. To show us the way back. Just like we do. A veil over our mind, mm -hmm. not knowing who we are, what we are. The Savior went through the same thing. And this is after he has a fullness of glory. If we could go back to the verse 19 and that specific word worship, I think that's a key word. Uh, it comes from two Anglo-Saxon words, we orth and sipe. We orth means worthiness. Sipe means the condition of. And so real worship is to constantly, con to constantly increase the condition of worthiness that we have. And so another indication is, is that this is an incremental process, and we'll be getting into that in just a bit, of, of how that worship, as we worship, we become more and more like the Christ. Mm -hmm. um, to the point that we receive a fullness, I think one of the most dramatic aspects of this section is that the Lord says, let me show you how I came to a fullness. That's right. And then let me compare you directly to me and let me teach you how you can receive a fullness of, of all that I have. And it's dependent upon that we daily increase the state or condition of our worthiness. Okay. It's progressional. Yeah, you brought up too is that the revelation clarifies for us then a doctrine that's become problematic in Christianity, and that is the oneness of the Father and the Son, and the fact that Jesus Christ is appropriately referred to, especially in Old Testament times, as the Father. He's the Father of heaven and earth. I know with my students, I'm, they, they look and they say, the Father of heaven and earth. And I said, not Father in heaven. There's a difference. Father of heaven. 
and he indicates here the reason in verse 4 there one. He says, the reason my name is Father is because he, referring to Father in heaven, he gave me of his fullness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not until he comes in the flesh then that people start really referring to him as the Son or the Son of God. But before that, he's known as the Father appropriately. It's an all right title for the Savior to be called the Father. And, and this talks about this, how he was in the beginning, verse 8, and, and that verse 10, especially the worlds were made by him. As you said, Craig, he gave that up to come here to be our exa example. Yes, he came here f uh, ultimately to atone, but along the way he set an example of, of uh, and really qualified himself to do that atonement because of the choices he made. And, and so in verse 12, uh, I, John, saw that he received not of the fullness at first, but received grace yeah. for grace, and he received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until he received a fullness, and thus he was called the Son of God because he received not of a fullness at first. Like you just said, he wasn't the Son really until he came and, and submitted himself to that, subjected himself to that condescension, mm -hmm. and then he set up the pattern for us, uh, being tempted, he chose. Mm -hmm. He chose rightly. Can we choose rightly? He implies yes. <laughs> that, that we can. Yeah. What's interesting still, though, is the fact to me that it's written in between the lines, I guess we could say, that when it says he doesn't have a fullness at first, they're talking about the first of his mortal life. And uh, Elder Talmadge in Jesus the Christ indicates that there's a veil mm -hmm. that right. comes over that baby's mind. And I have a statement here from Lorenzo Snow that is so interesting about the change that comes. He said, when Jesus lay in the manger, a helpless infant, he knew not that he was the Son of God and that formerly he created the earth. When the edict of Herod was issued, he knew nothing of it. He had not power to save himself, and his father and mother had to take him and fly into Egypt to preserve him from the effects of that edict. So if, uh, he didn't even know. That it, he, he has to start without any advantage over memory, of knowledge of anybody, but he shows us you can do that. And of course, yeah. he does grow grace for grace, because in time, he grows and learns who he is. By the time he's 12, he recognizes that Joseph's not his father, yeah. that God is his father. The Greek, I think the big question here, or the big, the big goal, the significant goal here, is that the Lord says, I am the father, also, in addition, because of his premortal uh, role as the father, but he says in verse four, he says, "I am the father, because I have received fullness." But he says, "I'm also the son, because I didn't start with fullness." And and the idea then of this section is is how did the son who didn't start with fullness become the father who received all that Elohim has? And Jesus then says. Let me explain to you how I went from mm -hmm. son to father for the purpose of you also following my example and you going from son or daughter to fullness. Yeah. And the, to be, to, for the Christ to be willing to compare us directly to him is a magnificent compliment to us. It is. He, I think it, it, it may be uh, tempting to say, well, that's fine for him. I can see how he could become like his father, but not what about me. us. But the whole gist of this section is for him to say, no, no, you can do this That's process right. too. What, Let what, me man. show you how it works. I can bring you there the same way by degrees of glory will grow. The or degrees of grace is the other way he says. Yeah, the, the grace. For yeah, that's grace. just what isn't I was that an interesting say. phrase. He, the, those phrases give so much hope. I, John, saw that Jesus received not of the fullness at first, but he received grace for grace. Obviously, his steps are, by age 12, I mean, he's far outstripped everyone. But the idea is, is that he went a step at a time. And then he says, and he received not of the, verse 13, and he received not of the fullness at first, but he continued from grace to grace. The prophet Joseph Smith said he went from one spiritual level to the next spiritual level. Or as we stated the definition of worship is he goes from one state or condition of worthiness to the next state or condition of worthiness. And the thing that gives us hope is that we can say, okay, now my steps are much smaller than the Christ, 
but that I also can progress. In fact, the comparison that he makes is in verse, um, verse number 18. If you are faithful, you shall receive of the fullness that John just bore witness that Jesus has received. That's absolutely phenomenal. And, and 22, yeah, 23. And all of those verses 20, yeah. give the same. Verse 20 is Let's incredible. look at them. Ye, verse 23. Ye were also in the beginning with the Father. You're like me in that respect. And that which, uh, that which is spirit, even the spirit of truth, truth is knowledge. We can get this truth the same way Jesus got it, by degrees, by obeying the same as he did. And then we grow in that ability to receive until verse 27 says we receive a, a fullness when we keep his commandments. Verse 28, he that keepeth his commandments receiveth truth and light, just like Christ did, until he is glorified in truth and knows everything. Well, and, and the, the idea here, back to, to verse 20. Yeah, that's what I want to do. If you keep my commandments, you shall receive of, of his fullness and be glorified in me as I am in the Father. Therefore, I say unto you, you shall receive grace for grace. Now, now the idea here, sometimes in a very kind of surface way, we say, well, Jesus was our example. See, he was <laughs> baptized. And it's really interesting in this record, that's even thrown in. That's thrown in in verse 15. Mm -hmm. And so there are the simple things we can do that the Savior did before us uh, and still understanding how quickly he grew, but it was by making those yeah. simple choices. I will choose to be baptized. Mm -hmm. I will choose to respond to the promptings of the Spirit. I will choose not to be tempted by Satan. And, and so you can have it too if you keep my commandments. And I see that, that kind of saying here. And if you do that, that's kind of the second part of this section, isn't it? Is that you alluded to that, Steve. If you do that, you're going to receive like I received. And, and, and then starting with about verse 24, uh, it's going to tell us what we receive, isn't it? I, I don't know if there's great significance to it, but I've taken some information. It talks not, it mentions grace to grace, verse 13, but it also talks about grace for grace. Yeah. And it makes it... There's an exchange value there. That as Christ extends, extended grace in his mortal ministry, he received grace. More grace. And I look at it that when, when do I grow the most? Yeah. Is when you're extending grace. Yeah, when I'm trying to help someone to do something they can't do on their own. And uh, it's interesting, you know, back in section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord had already alluded to the fact, you know, as teachers we have this. He says, teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you. He's not talking about the people who are listening. He's talking about the teacher. teacher. The or person, the giver or the server. The giver, the one who's giving the grace, is going to be given as much grace as he can give. And because the it's service, I think it's because the Savior was giving so much. We have no record of his before he's baptized, but before that, he, he must be giving, yeah. serving. And as he serves others, he's growing uh, measure for measure. And as what he gives, he receives back. And that, that his service is growing out of his conversion, in a sense, if we can use that word, mm -hmm. his development. And that's a sign of someone who is developing spiritually as they're more apt to serve. And then he says the give. same thing to us. He says, this, and this is how you also progress. Mm -hmm. I, I like how he makes so many comparisons of us to him. Uh, Steve mm -hmm. alluded to this. Verse 21, he says, I was in the beginning with the Father. Then in 23, he says, you are also in the beginning with the Father. He says, uh, I, I am firstborn, and you can become firstborn. The way I progressed was grace. I'll be part of that church, that group. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I yes. can be an inheritor. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Thank you for the clarification. He, he says, I progressed grace for grace, grace to grace. You can progress grace for grace, grace to grace. And uh, to me, again, I come back to the idea that he would even compare me to him. Mm -hmm. It's a magnificent or, thing. Or that he even would reveal this yeah. to us. And, and I think as we, as we move through this section then, he talks a lot about the spirit of truth, intelligence, light, uh, those synonymous words again. And, and then to me, he, he gives us kind of the key uh, as to how we can gain that light. And, and we can't undersell this. Ooh, one of the crucial parts of the plan is agency. Mm -hmm. Christ came here with agency. And I think agency, yeah, I think agency is defined as well in this section as anywhere. Right. In verse 30, all truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself as all intelligence also. Otherwise, there is no existence. Agency appears to me is, is necessary for 
even our existence. And then the next verse, behold, here is the agency of man, and here is the condemnation of man, Mm -hmm. because that which was from the beginning is plainly manifest unto them, and they receive not the light. And this is about receiving the light, and eventually Christ is the giver of the light, and, and it comes by appropriate use of agency. Yeah appropriate use, making choices that are correct. Like all revelations, this one, even more explicitly, locates agency in us. <laughs> it, right. it puts the power yeah. over our ultimate destiny right square on our shoulders by revealing to us the knowledge and then saying, now, you're Choose. empowered to act on that knowledge. That's right. There's our salvation, depending if we want it, and there's also our condemnation. But it is a little intimidating that he says it's plainly manifest. Right. <laughs> so that says something about us when we don't use our agency appropriately. It's here to be taken. They, the, well, the they know good from evil because the light of Christ. Yeah, they sure. know that every person has that given to them. But I thought it might be good to, to go to verse 38 where it yep. speaks of the innocence of the spirit mm-hmm. of man in the pre, pre-mortal life, in the beginning. And as we were born to heavenly parents, there was innocence. We began choosing what we wanted to become. And I've thought often that the plan of our Father in Heaven basically is just to give us every opportunity to become what we choose to become sure. with some opposition that he, he mentions here, that, you know, verse 39 in particular, the wicked one cometh. <laughs> when they're born into this lot world, we have to remember Lucifer was cast to this earth we're born into this world and he's here he's willing waiting for us <laughs> to take away the light <laughs> yeah, and truth right. that we have. Can I add another dimension that, that has not been emphasized as yet that really makes this discussion of agency uh, even more powerful? In verse number 24, he talks of a truth which is knowledge of things as they really are. And here he's talking about an absolute truth. Those educators, scientists, etc., would say today there is no such thing as an absolute truth. God is giving us a definite indication that there is an absolute truth that well, it proceeds from God. Well, things as they really were. Yes, <laughs> and, and as they are. But, but he's saying the reason that agency becomes so important is he says, may I share with you an absolute truth? Now, you have your agency to either accept it Mm-hmm. or to reject it. And he says, this is the whole right, as stated in verse 30, he says, this is what the existence is all about. You have an absolute truth that's given to you from God that will guide you and direct you to become like him. I now offer it to you. Now, you use your agents. You can or receive reject. or reject it. Mm-hmm. But that is the very existence of man. It yeah. leads to either his exaltation or to his condemnation. Well, and using that, you think of the truths here. One is that you were in the beginning. We, we lived before we came here. I had an interesting conversation one time with a gentleman on an airplane, and he basically wanted to know what's the difference between your church, my church, which was kind of fun, because often they'll ignore you if they find out you're a professor at BYU in religion. And I shared with him one of those ideas, as we know, we lived with our heavenly parents before we came here, a knowledge of things as they really were. He was enthralled. Yeah, a lot of people share that. Whether their official uh, doctrine does or not, a lot mm-hmm. of people share that notion. Or they long they to know, know it somewhere. Yeah. Or, or the other part is, too, sometimes I hear students at BYU say, oh, wait till I get into the real world. Yeah. And I'm going, and what are they going to teach you out there? Do they teach you about things as they were, like pre-mortality? Are they going to talk to you about things to come, yeah. resurrection? judgment, yeah. glory. Well, and, and I think the idea of knowing things as they really were, even, uh, I mean, all of us around this table have advanced degrees and we're trained in the tools of the world. And I know especially Steve looks back at history, he's a historian. But to know what really happened, mm-hmm. you spend a lot of time in libraries searching for that, don't yeah. you, Steve? <laughs> and, and but losing faith that you can ever recover that, it. That's right, <laughs> because it's, it's revealed. revealed. And that, that's the key here. And, and one of the challenges we have then is, is this idea that Satan was here, we show up, and we show up in families. And th- then that, that Satan comes, and it's not always him directly, but the world he's helped establish, the theories of men, mm-hmm. the non-absolute truths, the, the kind of the wishy-washiness, and, and verse 39, as Craig referred to, and that wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth, and I see through two ways, through disobedience, which means we've probably misused our agency after we're born to this earth, 
from the children of men and because of the traditions of their fathers. And the rest of this section appears to be now fathers. Don't blow it yeah. in keeping your children protected in the light they come with and increasing that light by your teaching. And so we see members of the first presidency here, verse 40, but I have commanded you to bring up your children in light and truth. But verily I say unto you, my servant Frederick G. Williams, you have continued under this condemnation. You have not taught your children light and truth according to the commandments, and that wicked one hath power as yet over you, and this is the cause of your affliction. Mm -hmm. And it goes through the rest of the first presidency, and you're thinking, these brethren, you'd think, might be beyond this, but no. Yeah. And, and to me, it's fascinating because they're, it centers it back on the family. In a world, an environment where truth is being literally robbed from all of us, where do we find the haven? Yeah. The, the but it says to teach as a family. I've, been, I've lived with Jerry in Jerusalem and his family. I've watched him teach. As I say, you spent time to teach your family. Right. We had family home evenings. We had fun together. Mm -hmm. But we had times we were teaching them truths. And I think that's what he's saying here, too. You're going to be a family. Are you going to teach them? Well, really, God, the, the very famous statement, especially here at BYU, the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. You can interpret that many ways. But one of the ways I'd like to interpret it is the glory of God is coming to know His truth. And then how you handle that truth that's right. and how you teach that truth that's going to determine whether you're ever going to have fullness, whether you're going to reach your destiny or not. Well, and, and to some extent, as we look at this marvelous section, many of us are under the same condemnation as these early brethren. Are we really teaching our children light and truth? I know Craig and I served as bishops together, and, and, and how often it was, you just ask a family to do the simple thing. Not only a whole family home evening, but not bowl every Monday night. Let's open the scriptures and talk about them with our children. Let's invite them to understand how Christ grew, and then from that, we can grow the and, same way. And that permits them, the children also, Grace for grace. Mm -hmm. That's right. Grace to grace. Yeah. And parents will grow quiet a bit too. I've learned a lot teaching my children. Right. <laughs> you no, know, Christ doesn't underestimate our capacity in this revelation. We shouldn't underestimate the capacity of our children, our children. to and protect gain them. Light. Yep. And I sure don't want to be held accountable for traditions no. that stole from them their access to the light. Yeah. That's right. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.